Welcome to CE Ag Talks, the video series from CE Ag World, a media site devoted to the business of growing food undercover, including greenhouse produce, vertical farms, and outdoor protected crops. I'm Kristen Zeit, and I'm the content lead for CE Ag World. Today, I'm talking to Sam Bertram, CEO of 1.1, which just launched Apollo Farm outside of Phoenix, Arizona. The Apollo Farm is essentially an automated warehouse solution that has been turned into a farm. So the, the real reason we had spent the first five years of our business life, of this business's life, developing our own solution completely ourselves. So you see those robots up there sitting in the robot graveyard? We had already developed those robots, you know, the lighting systems, the grow boards, the aeroponic irrigation. We had a solution. And then we came across AutoStore at, a, at an important inflection point for the industry and obviously for our business as well. And we decided, you know what? Now that we have patent protection, we have an issued patent on this method of vertical farming, we can start integrating best-in-class solutions to, into one single farming solution. That's a, the best way to think about it. We took the auto store infrastructure, took best sort of standardized lice, irrigation and irrigation practices, HVAC and these kinds of things, put it all together, and now we have a solution. The farm itself uh, has been optimized for leafy green production, microgreen production, and the production of some herbs. The same system and the same dimensions can be used for mushrooms and strawberries. Those are both in our near future. The system itself, a few of the reasons that it's different. You know, vertical farms seem to do very well at small scales. And then when they try and scale up, struggles. The, I think one of the hardest parts is scaling the automation. Scaling lights is relatively straightforward. Scaling irrigation is relatively straightforward. It's been done inside of greenhouses. Scaling HVAC, you know, I wouldn't say it's straightforward because we have a very dense system and airflow is absolutely key, of course, to growing plants. But it's, it's really do the bones of your system scale well. And so with the auto store system, it's super modular, super scalable. You can have a thousand square foot facility with two robots, or you can have a 200,000 square foot facility with a thousand robots. Both of those use cases work. And so we can ride that scalability wave that auto store has already proven. So I think the difference, if I was to summarize it, is scalability, reliability, and density. I used to think that density didn't really matter. You know what I mean? I, I didn't think that the fact that vertical farms were way more dense was really a factor that I would stress out in the market because it doesn't, it, at the time, I thought it doesn't really add anything. If there's no really business value proposition there, I believe I was wrong. Our whole goal with this technology is for it to be built inside of distribution centers, mm -hmm. inside of distribution centers, or share a wall or something very similar. Now it becomes clear why the density matters. It becomes really difficult to build greenhouses next to all major regional distribution centers because that land, it's tough to make that land exist and it's expensive land and it's not always the best place to build greenhouses and all those kinds of things. But if I can put a standardized unit that can change in some ways, footprint, crop, these kinds of things, a standard unit inside a distribution center, the retailer, the distributor owns it, the product comes out of the farm day in, day out, directly into cold storage, and then out into the retail distribution chain, those economics work. And in the game of vertical farming, economics have been the biggest problem. We've had to address that through dropping the capital cost to build these facilities, dropping the labor cost of the facility, dropping the electrical cost of the facility. But if you can cut out the entirety of the leg of transportation from producer to distribution, if you can cut that out completely and there is no human between production and distribution, and it is owned by the retailer and the distributor, you have an economics case that is very strong for commodity leafy greens products. Very strong. If my margin is built into the build of the facility and my customer can amortize that margin over a 10 to 15 year period so that the retailer and the distributor, they are technically producing the product as cost of goods sold without margin on top of it, the cost of goods good sold coming out of the farm is extremely similar to the prices they're currently paying to buy the product, get it into the distribution center, and then put the product out there on the shelves or send it out to restaurants or schools. That's the goal. I mean, as you know, the, the vertical farming sector has been undergoing a massive shift 
right yeah. now. You know, there've been a yeah. lot of bankruptcies. There's a lot of restructuring. The uh, investment yeah. climate has changed significantly. And there's, frankly, there's a lot of skepticism floating around oh, yeah. relating to vertical farming as a viable business. What do yes. you say to that? And so how is Apollo Farm going to succeed where others have failed? What vertical farming is trying, what the vertical farming industry is trying to do is extremely hard. And our competitors are very good and the margins are not massive. So the problem we're trying to solve is very hard. Number one. Two, you're trying to solve a hardware, a software and a biology problem all at once. So I, I, framing the entire question is what we have been doing is very, very hard. The whole industry. Lots of, and we are included in this, lots of promises and sort of ideals were communicated that never came true. So this is where I think the skepticism is largely warranted. You know, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, the, what you want to do when you're going out and doing PR and media is to make, you know, the juiciest claims to get the most attention about the most idealistic future that we possibly can. Hardware development is extremely hard and it is not fast. And here we're dealing with a living being that we have to, uh, we have to grow inside of these systems day in, day out. Doing it once isn't that hard. Doing it 24-7, 365 is very, very hard. So that's number one. Um, it all comes down to cost. And the answer is in cost. How much does it cost to build your facility? If you go and have a look at what most of our vertical farming competitive systems look like, very expensive. Heavy steel, distributed network of motors, distributed network of sensors, belts, conveyors, movement all over the place, stuff to go wrong all over the place, and an expensive system to boot. One of the reasons we partnered with Autostore was because of the cost of their system. It is less expensive than the other warehouse automation solutions. And what Auto Store has done extremely well is simplicity. Unfortunately, when we started the business, we jammed the company full of engineers. This is my fault. I'm pointing my finger at no one but myself. Jammed the company full of engineers. And then we started developing all of this technology at once. And yes, conceptually, it was all to drop the cost. But in reality, it's extremely hard to develop 10 to 15 new technologies and then have them work at scale immediately. You understand what I mean? So I think, I think the difference with Apollo is that we're integrating technologies that already exist, already proven at scale. They just need to play nice together. And a lot of that comes down to the software. Back to my point on cost. I think the cost to build these facilities is going to be lower than our competitors. I have no data to back that up because I don't know what they cost, but I do understand robotics and engineering and infrastructure quite well, and I can make some decent and conservative assumptions about those things. Number two. There is simply no LED efficiency gain that you can make that is anywhere close to moving your business from San Jose to Arizona. We go from a 30 cent per kilowatt hour rate over there. How is that ever going to work in Compton? How is that ever going to work in New York to a situation where we're at seven, eight, nine cents per kilowatt hour? So if I can build a facility for a lower cost, that means the margin I need to generate to get a three to five year return on capital drops. If I move my facility to Arizona, one of my highest line items, cost of goods sold, electricity, drops by at least half, if not two thirds. So it's these kinds of like boring, practical, real world, world decisions that have set us up, set us up differently than, than I think a lot of our competitors. And I think finally it is business model. Business model has always been a question. Do we do what greenhouses do? Do we, do we not do what greenhouses do and develop the tech ourselves, build the tech ourselves, and our product is the leafy greens? We're very clear. Our product is the farm and we are marketing and selling these products to retailers and distributors. In the interim, small and medium businesses, of course, we're going to pick these up. We're going to help them stand them up, get product out into the market. We have great relationships with distributors and retailers. The ultimate goal is to be build for each of the retail and distribution companies, build 25 of these puppies in major distribution centers and distribute out to the customer. The economics work much better that way. If last point on this and, and we'll move on. If I grow the product for $3.50 and then I need to sell that product for $7 a pound, that works if I'm selling five, five ounce clamshells to large retailers. What if I want to get to one pound clamshells? What if I want to get to other products that are lower margin? I have to find a way to grow the product for half that 
and then sell it for half of $7. That's really, really hard to do. But if my margin is baked into the financing of the, the system and the retailer is working with the cost of goods sold and I'm not dousing a 100% markup on top of that, those economics can work. So I think it's CapEx cost, operating cost clearly, and then business model. What are your plans in terms of managing energy usage? Our number one priority as a business is to have systems that grow highly nutritious, long shelf life, organic produce to get into the mouths of consumers. Our mission is all around human health. Now, feed humanity, preserve nature. There is an element of this that is preserve nature. The fact that we are inside, we've got so many wins already as a vertical farm being inside, way less land, way less water, all these kinds of things. Vertical farming is not a panacea. It doesn't solve every single problem uh, at once. Energy consumption, from a sustainability perspective, energy consumption is the worst part of vertical farms. Now, if I'm getting that electricity from a nuclear power plant, I'm really happy about that. If I'm getting that electricity from a solar farm, I'm really happy about that. If I'm getting it from a waste to energy system, really happy about it. If I'm getting it from natural gas, I'm still pretty happy about it. If I'm getting it from coal, less happy about it. So it is a factor. If I let that drive our business top line, it, it wouldn't be it, vertical farming. It doesn't solve the energy issue. It's not intended to solve the energy issue. But again, it just comes down to being practical, being wise about where you put these things. Of course, our preference is not these vertical farms to be fueled by coal power plants. But I, I suppose I'll pose that as a question back to you and, and the audience. If I can feed locals high quality, fresh, nutrient dense produce and use coal power to do it, is that a net positive? Is that a net negative? I have my own opinions. I'd be interested in yours. I'd be interested in your, in your audience. But it's a trade-off. There, there are no solutions, only trade-offs, you know? Obviously, you've got the technology, you've got the engineering part of it. What is, when you're talking about um, these units being owned by the, by the grocers, run by the grocers, what's the role of the grower in all of that? Grower, vital, period. Without them, this, without our grower, the growers, this is not and would not be possible. Something has changed in the last two years. The something that has changed is large language models. Artificial intelligence in the past has really been sort of, you know, data analytics on steroids for the most part. Large language models are different. If all of my farms, if all of our farms are feeding a large language model information about the telemetry data, temperature, humidity, CO2, airflow, that kind of stuff, light level irrigation, all that data that comes out of the farm, and especially if I can get imagery up to that large language model, I now have the capability to have a large language model be the grower advisor. Now, this is, this is not a complete solution today. In the next five to 10 years, I believe it can be. Still, the, ro the, the role of the grower is vital within our business because A, large language models are not perfect. And B, there's still a lot of nuance that humans can pick up on that large language models and cameras and these kinds of things cannot pick up on. But the power of large language models, I think, should not be underestimated as it applies to vertical farming operations. Now, additionally, growers and plant scientists in R&D, new crop introduction, yield improvement, all these kinds of things, again, absolutely vital. They're not going anywhere. In fact, we're trying to hire more. There is a shortage of these individuals. Uh, out in the market, very, very hard to find. Um, but the new tool that is real uh, is large language models, and and we leverage that to the you know to the greatest possible extent. And you're already working with Whole Foods. Yeah. So behind me, obviously, the farm that's growing the produce that ends up in uh, inside of Whole Foods. The number one thing that Whole Foods really cared about was local, clean mainly local, second was clean, and then third was the lengthy shelf life. Fulfilling on that local promise, you know, being within 50 miles of where it's actually grown, you know, some people have 200 or 400 miles as the radius for, you know, local. It's, it's something that I think we can legitimately express. So that, you know, we have had conversations with Whole Foods for nine to 12 months about, you know, the, the onboarding process is not short for going into Whole Foods, you know, organic certification they have to review, food safety they have to review, all of our other claims, local claims, they have to review. So that took quite some time. We got there in the end. We got product on the shelf and it's moving really well. 
And fortunately, after eight years, I've been punched in the face enough to have a balance, you know, have a yin and a yang to that, you know. And I, I hope, I hope to not come out and have isolated claims out of context, you know, made as if I think the world is going to change in the next fifteen minutes. I don't. I think this is very hard. I think this is very slow, and I think it's going to take a very, very long time before we make it ubiquitous in the U.S. and and then we start talking about the rest of the world. You know what I mean? That the, not Europe, the, the the world, the part of the world that really needs these micronutrients. But I believe, and I'm not, I, I do not think this is self delusion. I believe very, very strongly that in the same way as greenhouses have done to the Netherlands and and soon to be the rest of the world, vertical farms are going to have the same impact or more. And it is about the next phase of our business is about keeping the blinders on, executing extremely well on the products that these farms grow, being happy customers and high quality nutritious products out in the market. And then we can sort of take the blinders off a little bit and start looking at mushrooms and strawberries. But for the time being, we're an extremely focused business. We're not running at many millions of dollars a month like we once were and tens of millions of dollars a month like our competitors were. This is a tight ship and all of the metrics that matter, gross profit, cost of goods sold, those are the metrics that matter to us. So yeah, I mean, though our vision is grand and I mean what I say when I say feed humanity, nourish humanity and protect the environment, preserve nature. This is a very practical unit economics game in 2025. And we've been here for eight years of battle and we're going to be here for another 10. And, you know, we, we hope to provide as much value as we possibly can to the market. Like our whole goal is to deal with this micronutrient deficiency problem that is absolutely pervasive throughout the United States that cause metabolic dysfunction that causes all of this chronic disease among many other causes, but is potentially the main culprit. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you. I, I really appreciate your time today.